So welcome everybody. I, I hope that you can all hear me. Please give me a thumbs up if you can. Wonderful. Uh, welcome to the fifth and final, uh, really very special uh, webinar for our uh, post-pandemic city series, The New Possible. And today we are so delighted to welcome the, the ambassador, the 19th ambassador of the Republic of Ghana to the United States. And he has been the ambassador since 2017. So welcome Dr. Barfur Adjay Barua. I hope I have pronounced your name a little correctly. Well, uh, you, you, you've done the best that anybody could. I can do better. <laughs> I will practice. <laughs> I can do okay. better. Sure. Um, so uh, this is the ambassador's second appointment. And uh, before this, he has served as the ambassador of Ghana to countries such as Japan, Singapore, New Zealand, Australia, and so many more. And he was born in Ghana, in uh, Kumasi, where he was educated initially, and then he went on with his first degree, which was in geography. And then he went on to attain his Master of Science degree at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and also His Excellency has a PhD from the University of Indiana. So as you can see that being a diplomat is not the only thing that he has been a professor, he has been a speaker, and an absolutely passionate, dedicated uh, um, person who has led his country. Um, after that, he went on to do many more things and uh, the ambassador further earned a certificate in counseling from London in 1989 and many other appointments. And then he, as the development advisor, uh, Dr. Barfur also provided consulting and training to many institutions in Ghana and uh, the UK, as well as the Wales. He has lectured in many, many organizations and universities and forums, uh, both national, international, as well as in his uh, local areas all over the world and he has held very many public positions and is a dedicated public servant. Um, so without further ado, I want to welcome His Excellency Dr. Barfur to the City Planning and Urban Affairs Program at Boston University and more importantly we are very very excited to hear from him firsthand about the kinds of headways and the projects he's making in Ghana and also the vision he has not only for his country, but also for the entire African continent. So thank you, uh, Dr. Barfur. The floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, with, with that introduction, I'm afraid of what is it that I'm going to be able to uh, as it were, in part, as far as uh, our audience and maybe amongst ourselves uh, is concerned, it's a bit, and I would want to remind people that uh, when somebody has, in the course of a lifetime, held so many uh, different positions, he should tell you something that the person is no expert at any of them. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, I believe that you see, the, the issue of urbanization for uh, countries like us and for Africa generally, uh, it's a very difficult one. Difficult in the sense that urbanization has something to do with one, rapid expansion of the population. And then two, a certain assumption, mostly on the part of the population that go to the city and make a fortune, which basically says that the city ought to have both the environment and the resources to contain the people who are flocking into the city. 
And in, especially in the case of Africa, where most of the people who come into the city with a view to making a fortune tend to be uh, unskilled, no sort of uh, uneducated, maybe with a little bit of schooling. And therefore, what you may have or what you need to have as a basis for holding on to this segment of the population, most of the cities wouldn't have. And the influx into the cities have been very rapid since the African countries you know, got independence, and it applies to us. So you do recognize that we have always been more or less in a shortfall situation insofar as handling you know, the, the impact and exigencies of urbanization are concerned. For instance, that whole mentality of going to the city to, as it were, make a fortune had forced a certain kind of excessive demand on the kinds of services, social or otherwise, that the cities ought to have. Now, coming with that is the fact that there have always been lapses or certain levels of laxity in land use management in most of our cities. It's quite demonstrable in Kumasi, quite demonstrable in Accra, quite demonstrable in the other you know, urban centers. And therefore, considering the fact that most of the people who are coming into the cities don't have requisite skills and requisite education and such, unless there is that level of management of land use, it becomes very difficult. And you do recognize also that the excess influx can actually never be able to be contained irrespective of the velocity with which the cities you know, try to cope because of the fact that even our financial management system makes it very difficult for us to provide the basics by way of uh, housing, services like health, urban transportation. And then because most people seem to believe that the be all and end all in terms of economic you know, progress, especially in our kind of environment, has something to do with merchandising. It basically says that even those areas that we had managed to keep as residential areas, and this is where basic urban planning comes in, those areas have been overrun by commercial activity. And especially in those uh, you know, countries like ours where you have a whole army of people trading in commodities, not in huge quantities, and therefore you do have you know, a certain kind of array of um, uh, selling spots along streets, along a uh, few uh, open areas and such. So it makes land use management a serious problem. And unfortunately, we also have a difficulty whereby because not every piece of ground is owned by the government on behalf of the country. People who trade in, you know, in land parcels don't really care as to what you intend to do you know, with a parcel. So before you know it, you are going to be purchasing some property. Nobody actually dictates to you as to what you can put there or what you cannot put there. And it disrupts the whole urban environment insofar as a certain kind of orderly you know, uh, development of the urban space is concerned. So sometimes 
when the government you know, uh, decides to be strong enough and insist that there ought to be a certain kind of parcel that ought to be used for this or that, you do have a whole bit of resistance because one, the individual is going to argue that he didn't purchase the land from the government. The individual is going to argue that when he did the purchase, nobody actually signed an agreement that you can only use it for that. And that obviously disrupts the you know, orderly planning of cities. And where you would want to impose a certain kind of order, you also recognize that there are going to, beside the litigation that might happen, and the government usually will win such litigation, you also develop a certain you know, uh, army of people within the urban environment who believe that they've been more or less sliced out. And therefore, they take a, a lot of umbrage and become, as it were, uncooperative citizens because they feel that their livelihood has been attacked. Now, when you, you recognize that one, there is a huge disparity between the population in terms of growth and the provision of the kinds of services that ought to be within the urban environment, you realize that all you've got is a certain kind of serious spread. In some cases, very uncontrolled. In some cases, because of the type of spread, you can't even manage sanitation. You can't manage intra-urban you know, transportation. You can't actually manage the internal utilization of the urban space. So all that you end up doing is building on chaos and building on chaos. The centers of most of these cities, more or less, sometimes appear reasonable. They appear beautiful to a certain extent and all that. But the lack of relationship between what goes on in the center of the cities and the people who need to come into the center of the cities to help the cities grow make it so difficult for one to realize the economic potential of both the city uh, as an environment and the population that claims to be in you know, a residence of the city. So the, the haphazard development of our cities constitute a big problem for us. And urban renewal is never cheap. And in fact, you can only renew up to the point where your general economy can sustain the expense of renewal. We end up therefore with you know, either huge areas of slums or pockets of slums within areas where indeed you should not ordinarily find you know, the slum development. And everybody seems to claim a certain piece of ground simply because at least legally, the government or the nation as a whole con don't constitute the owners of the property. And that, you know, is one of these, uh, and, and indeed it is the main, you know, difficulty as far as the African urban environment is concerned. And, you know, as far as, you know, my country's uh, urban you know, uh, <clears throat> development is concerned. Because now you go into, you know, uh, Accra, for instance, and you've gotten some of these rather shiny uh, residential developments, which are particularly off-center. Maybe in the context of a country like this, they will call them suburban areas. But they certainly are not very suburban. Not suburban because it isn't as if they have been created as more or less offsets 
of the total urban area. They have been you know, located there because the developers found a parcel of land reasonable and cheap enough for them to develop these uh, residences. And therefore, most of the housing are housing that are designed for people who could, as it were, more than afford it. And they, in their turn, bring a lot of congestion on the roads that lead into the center of town. So we, we have um, you know, these kinds of uh, difficulties simply because the conscious planning of most of our cities have always been sort of, if not sidestepped, decently ignored. I grew up in Kumasi. When I was a youngster, Kumasi was probably the most beautiful city you could capture. And in fact, the ancient um, Arabs who came to trade in gold and whatnot in the Ashanti region are uh, quoted to have said that if you haven't been to Kumasi, you haven't been to paradise. The city was built on a series of ridges. So Kumasi never knew floods. And you, you could see where you are going in the city on the basis of even the topography. And the Ashanti you know, uh, authorities made sure that people didn't mess up on the, until central government became a lot more potent and people started making the kinds of um, uh, what you might call decisions which were not particularly in the best interest of, of the city. So when we are talking about you know, the mega development of you know, uh, cities in, in Africa and especially as it relates to us, we have a mountain to climb at a time when we need resources to take care of you know, issues, health and other things. And you know, the current uh, pandemic that we are in is a case in point. The diversion of resources to contain that and the fact that even in trying to contain it, our mode of commerce, our mode of you know, residences, the mixture of different types of you know, uh, economic um, you know, uh, capabilities in the cities and that make it so difficult even to plan an attack on uh, the pandemic. So I do believe that you know, the sustainability of African cities, and especially in the context of the current uh, you know, problem that we all have across the globe, is a very difficult one. We are sort of lucky that um, when you know, the statistics are being put out, you know, they go for the US and Western Europe and whatnot and whatnot. Ours, you know, is reasonably contained, and Ghana has done very well as far as that is concerned. But given the way we live, given the fact that even in the open markets, you know, in Ghana, it is almost impossible to, as it were, forge social distancing and all that. You, you, you see a certain kind of potential for a certain kind of explosion of this pandemic if we are unable to find something to hold, you know, to hold it down. And, and these are some of the issues we need to tease out when we would want to talk about, you know, mega uh, urbanization and sustainability, you know, in countries like ours. Because even though we have the capacity to do things right, Maybe the systems, the regulations, and the will, you know, political will to rectify some of these things are lacking. And we need to ask it to a bolster, you know, on this. I don't know whether that, uh, you know, does justice to a certain introduction to the subject.
Absolutely, Ambassador. You know, uh, as you are saying these things, you know, it, it's it's amazing how it resonates with much of the development of uh, the developing world, parts of Asia, other places as well. And unfortunately, you know, um, unfortunately or fortunately, shall we say that Africa, the continent of Africa and Ghana per se, is the last bastion where urbanization is taking place. Sure. And we already know all the problems that you are speaking of come with this lack of development, particularly lack of political will. You know, mm -hmm. it's not the technology. And yet, I think we are all sort of waiting, not doing enough and in time. Sure. And I think that is what we would like to highlight as not only your message or the new message for Ghana as we move forward, uh, as we look at the linkages in our education and so forth. So absolutely. You do have a few questions. Uh, sure. Andrea? Absolutely. There is one question in the chat. Um, so it reads, how can land use decree or land use act help in urbanization and sustainability in Ghana and African countries? Well, if the act is on the books, it helps. But the act being on the books itself is not going to do the business. It is the supervision of the application of the you know, act. Because sometimes people know that maybe what they are setting out to do is incorrect under the rules, under the act. But for some strange reason, either because of some inducement or what have you, they, they, they do you know, uh, make changes. If I personally have had uh, a, a certain kind of experience in this. I used to run the National Tourist Board. The board had a piece of land for which I believe that it would be better used to build uh, some kind of a residence for the chief executive or the board, as opposed to paying rents. Yet, when we made the effort to utilize the land, ah, you had all kinds of objections coming from wherever, you know, to the extent that in, in the final analysis, the government asked somebody to go and investigate. The person says, well, the board is within its rights to do what it's doing. And secondly, they conform to the planning, you know, uh, you know, structures as we have it in the city. But at that time, and you know, those days I was a bit younger, so I was uh, some kind of a hothead. I decided that I was not prepared to go through all that kind of hassle. And we stopped, you know, developing the property. Fortunately or unfortunately, now that is the location of the head office of Ghana Tourist Authority. So maybe it's okay. But it's just that unless the, the laws on the books are enforced reasonably, it isn't going, it, it, it wouldn't matter if we have, you know, a thousand, you know, rules, you know, in the rule book, it wouldn't change. And indeed, it exacerbates the situation. Yeah. It is that level of discipline that sometimes is lacking. That's great. Um, maybe we can wait for more questions. Unless, Andrea, sure. are there any more questions in the meantime? Um, there are a couple more in here. Um, it says, well, there's a compliment on your shirt. I will say that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell my wife, she makes them. <laughs> yeah. Um there is an there is a couple more questions, but um one more. Um besides political will, can we use tribal coordination to sustain development? Yeah, we, we could. We could, but you see, the in my view, 
a lot of uh, tribal arrangements, you know, have lost the bite because somehow uh, chiefs and other people, you know, within that kind of class uh, have been negatively influenced by the, as it were, Western, you know, ideas about governance and that kind of thing. And therefore, times when, you know, traditional elders and chiefs and such could put their feet down, you realize that, well, they aren't putting the, the feet down with the vigor that they should. And, you know, it's, uh, it's always difficult when people lose, you know, the asset where they are moral clout. And the, 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 the way um, Western influences have, you know, as it were, seeped into our traditional system, sometimes it's difficult. In a few cases, people do maintain, you know, the as it were, status quo in terms of you have to do it right. But most of the time, unfortunately, the whole velocity of urban development in particular makes it very hard for these uh, you know, uh, kinds of principles to be maintained. And I also believe that even when they are being maintained, you find in certain cases that they are being undermined by the administrative machinery that are not exactly a part of the you know, traditional setup. So there's always a certain bit of, you know, struggle between the two. I believe that part of the solution, if not, you know, the main bit of the solution, is for citizens themselves to decide that this is our city, this is where we live, this is where we want to make a living. It has to suit artists. And therefore, they have to make a, a commitment to the principles that will make a city livable for everybody. That's a great answer, really. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe we can uh, wait on the rest of the questions and uh, go on to the second part of the event today. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bafur. My it's pleasure. Really a pleasure to yeah. hear uh, these things from you and, and really your very honest appraisal of what needs to be done and what is happening on the ground. We very rarely get to see that kind of analysis uh, of things that are so dear to our hearts. So this is fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Pleasure. Uh, thank you. I, I, it is also my pleasure to uh, welcome my friend and colleague, professor and lawyer, as, as well as alumnus of the program, uh, Kwabena K. Abo Abo Sorry, Kwabena. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, uh, gosh, I need practice with this. Uh, Kwabena has been teaching in the program well before I even came in here, and he is extremely learned in the issues of public policy planning, law, and particularly environmental justice. He teaches a number of courses in our program, which all center around those issues. Uh, currently, he works as the Massachusetts Urban Environmental Manager for the US EPA. And before that, he has also worked in several other public agencies, as well as has his own global consulting um, uh, which specializes in energy, commercial, environment, and urban redevelopment projects. And prior to the US EPA appointment, Kwabena also worked for six years in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Office of Environmental Affairs, and where he has really worked with not only the technical planning pieces of it, but also with the communities and beyond to be able to make these plans a reality. And I know that currently Kwabena is very much uh, engrossed and dedicated to uh, 
contributing to the next chapter of Ghana's urbanization and sustainability, as well as uh, looking at education as a pathway to connect all these things. And uh, Kwabena, if you will please introduce what you are doing like currently in relationship to Ghana, and then the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, Madhu, thank you so much, both for your friendship, your support, and as a colleague, and Andrea as well. And, uh, you know, when the ambassador came uh, uh, 2017 to Boston University, you know, he met you through the phone. Now he's meeting virtually. <laughs> and so we yeah. hope that the next time it will be uh, face to face. But I have an interesting story to just mention. So uh, when the ambassador was appointed to the United States and I went to Washington, D.C. to meet him, and as soon as uh, I mentioned my name, uh, he said, you know, Dr. Kwabnachi Abwaje's son? And I said, yes. And he said, they were high school uh, classmates in Ghana. And as you know, my father was a professor at the Boston University Medical School for 35 years. So uh, the world was, and he's been uh, there for me since. So Ambassador, I honestly want to uh, uh, demonstrate my sincere appreciation for always being available to us and also uh, being available to Boston University. And uh, you know, as you know, Madhu, I mean, last year, uh, 2019, you know, I became a chief uh, in, in my uh, village, Janasi. And so I had a new name, which you may have to practice someday when you come to Ghana, <laughs> Osabe Mo Usube And that when the question, you know, was posed in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, the land use practices in the chief, I was smiling because it was a question that is a very delicate question. And the ambassador would say that, uh, you know, in, in Ghana is an interesting place because we have the traditional system and then we have the government system. And so the land belongs to the chief, but the minerals belongs to the government. So there's always have to be consultation, you know, in, in terms of what happens uh, on the land. And, as you also know, the, His Majesty, or Sajifwa Mutu for repenting, the came, was going to be here in uh, April. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we had to reschedule. So that's something that uh, he's looking forward to. I'm going to be uh, sharing my screen. I think Andrea has given me the control to share my screen. So bear with me. Sure. Uh, Rabina, I just want to say, and the ambassador, that it looks like I have, and I'm going to continue to have a great connection with Ghanaians because my niece, my very own niece, she's getting married next year to a Ghanaian gentleman. And so uh -huh. I'm going to come to Ghana for the wedding if this COVID dies down. <laughs> <laughs> we can't wait to host you. And uh, so my, I'm sharing my screen, but uh, the content of the information is approved by His Majesty's office, Nanette Chumese, which is the chief of staff uh, here. And, you know, as you know, there are three areas that I'm going to touch on. Uh, one is the uh, greenhouse project, which is, you know, in the territory uh, I call Achimobuyakwa, with the 950 communities there. Uh, in the eastern region of Ghana. And then the Environmental Task Force, which we call the Environmental Unit, and also the uh, new junior secondary school that is under the construction as a way to educate uh, young folks, you know. The Greenhouse uh, Initiative uh, is a public-private partnership between the Ghana Axiom uh, the, His Majesty's office, and then the youth greenhouse enterprise, because when you have the youth involved in projects, you're building a new generation, you know, and then uh, there's the construction of 10 greenhouses in a cluster within the country. And this will lead to an employment, you know, because as you know, uh, employment of the youth and getting them involved is an excellent way of 
sustainable development. Um, and the intent here is to reduce importation of vegetables because Ghana, you know, as much as, you know, is a developing country, we're still very rural, you know, but there's been certain areas where we have to import certain uh, basic needs. And the idea is also to increase production of vegetables output within the country and also create jobs for the youth, uh, both in urban and, and semi-urban places and also sustainable agriculture ventures. And the idea is also agro-processing of vegetables and environmental business, specifically agribusinesses to make it more of attractive for the youth, you know, because sometimes the youth will think, well, business, uh, agriculture is not really uh, sexy, something that I want to do. But when they realize that you can make money and also uh, sustain the environment, it's become very attractive to the place. And now uh, the project is started in Chibi, and Chibi is the uh, capital of His Majesty's territory and the other place is Isikem. And it's currently about 80% complete. And the most important thing I want to emphasize here is like, it has a lifespan of 40 years. So what that means is that when you start in this new generation, you know, they could also build upon and bring other youths along for 40 years, which is an incredible uh, uh, investment. And here are some of the here are some of the um, here are some of the pictures of the things that we have here. Uh, some of the vegetables that have been grown: cucumber, also uh, tomatoes, and sweet peppers. You know, and the other things I want to emphasize here is the environmental task force. The environmental task force is basically designed uh, in partnership with the government to uh, protect the land and the natural resources. Because over the years, we've had over the years we have had a lot of uh, damages on our water bodies, both the forest, the water, the mineral resource in the area. And the goal is like a, a three months pilot to see how we are able to mitigate the destruction and the damage that is ongoing, which is impacting the rural areas. And in terms of how things go, is that when there's an intelligence of areas where there's mining activities is happening, there's a tip off. And so then you can have the uh, task force will go in and prevent the activities that, that are ongoing. And this is using existing laws within the country. So for example, the criminal enforcement code and also uh, the section 12, which is a private citizen to be able to stop individuals that are doing illegal mining activities. And, and both government to government activities in terms of our traditional laws and government laws are enhanced and emphasized here that they both can work, you know, in coexistence. And the other key area here as well is that community engagement. You know, you want the community to be also involved because they are the ones that have been impacted. This, aside from the illegal mining activities, also to ensure that bushfires, flooding are also uh, an area that we can also prevent and stop. And then also to include cooperation with the security agencies in terms of protecting land invasion activities, especially chainsaws. And the task force both function, you know, in the geographic area of the Achimobiakwa traditional area and land. So it's restricted to the jurisdiction with the uh, uh, respect that if an activity is taking place outside the ju jurisdiction, then there will be communication with the other areas to ensure, you know, that we work with the other jurisdiction to make sure we prevent 
what is happening as well. And both within the laws of Ghana and also the customary and traditional laws of the country. And, you know, the goal here is one, to stop illegal mining activities, sand mining, water pollution, and also foreigners that come into the countries with specifically to want to do illegal mining because it's against the law to come in uh, to the country and then undertake illegal activities that is happening in the area. And this is, you know, Ghanaian nationals will be handed over to Ghana Police Service. And this is very new. The, the uh, task force was launched three weeks ago and His Majesty, you know, hold the meeting with both the traditional and the government officials that were launched. And, and as you can see, His Majesty, uh, social distance, he's got his face mask on. And if you see the arrangement of the chairs was also social distance. Some of my, I couldn't be here there because I was here. So these are some of my colleagues that were there. And the third presentation here in terms of the component is the education piece that His Majesty is launching. And the education is that he believes that the new generation must be equipped with education tools to be able to function for the future. Because we know that when you look at sustainable development, education can be used to alleviate poverty. And so the schools is designed for STEM education. And uh, this, he's building, you know, 10 schools within the area that is equipped and disability in terms of disability accessibility as well, because he's been one of the champions of people with disability in the area. And there are 10 schools. And I'm happy to say that my town, which is Junase, here is part of the schools that has been constructed. So in terms of like curriculum development and partnership with the program, you know, we'll be talking further, my dude, with the, you know, and these are the computer design of the schools and they should be uh, completed before the end of the year. And I'll conclude here. Great, thank you, Kwabina. That was excellent. You know, now we are beginning to see the sort of bigger picture that you know Ghana is trying to uh, make. Really, uh, try to make uh, great strides uh, under his leadership. You know, uh, to bring sustainability, education, urbanization, and so on together. And I think that you are absolutely right that you know as much as things happen at a national scale these kinds of projects that you show at a local scale start to become pilots which then uh, you know can can be looked at at a larger scale to make more impact so thank you so much uh, i i think we have some um, questions yeah. andrea um so if we want to go back um, to a couple of questions that came up during um, Dr. Barford's um, conversation, um, we can start there. Um, let's see. So we have, okay, um, this is from Stephen Brown. He says, I first visited Ghana in 1996. I returned last year after 23 years. Do you feel the infrastructure and sanitation supports expansion and mega urbanization as in some ways little has changed from what I have witnessed? Well, I, I suppose, I suppose um, you know, he could uh, say that very little has changed for the time that he has been, uh, you know, in, in Ghana. And it's only because the areas that he's talking about, that area of sanitation and improvement of the general urban environment, to make significant changes costs quite a lot of money. And the thing is, to take hold of 
most of the areas that a country ought to deal with, it becomes very difficult, both economically and politically, to, as it were, make a serious shift of the distribution of resources, you know, to take care of all the issues. And where you have significant competition amongst, um, you know, interests and amongst situations and such, those people who have responsibility for managing the budget always have a problem as to the preeminence of uh, issues, you know, to, to be considered. I, I, for one, you know, maybe like the questioner, I always move about certain areas of our environment, especially in Accra, which have existed and persisted for my lifetime, because we appear to either sometimes try to tackle, but maybe we do it half-heartedly or what have you, or because we don't ask to put the resources together and actually make a good go of them. So I do uh, accept you know, his comment that maybe not a whole lot has changed, but then, I would want to appreciate at least the his uh, view that there had been attempts. That in itself is not very comforting, but because I think that sometimes um, it is better to ignore everything and actually go a whole, a whole hog, clear a certain issue, and the rest could be added onto it. But then those who deal with political economies and whatnot might see it very differently. So maybe our problem is lack of sufficient resources to do the kinds of things that we have to do. But I suspect that maybe there is going to be a sea change in attitude so that we can take care of some of these uh, problems. I don't know where he spent most of the time that he was in, in, in Ghana, but if he's in Accra, I can support his view even more. Great, very good. Um, the next question says, do you think the private or public sector should play a major role in sustainable urban planning? The private sector should. The public sector, ought to have the, the lattice, you know, the public sector ought to de determine the way we would want the urban areas to develop. They need to determine to the, to the extent that we even have to find a way of making sure that within, say, uh, a span of five years, we don't have any additional beyond a certain number, because we have to you know, do some projections and make preparations to absorb, you know, those who will be coming into the urban areas. And then you see, fortunately now, we have, uh, you know, chiefs like Kwabna. Some of the projects that he was showing are projects which basically says, stay here and do this, and that you, you will probably make it better than you make it back in the city. So that probably may help, you know, suck away a proportion of those people who will just get up and go to Accra or go to Kumasi, you know, to try and make a, a certain kind of living. So I, I, I do suspect that we need to really, really sit down and nail down some of the bigger issues that affect the way our urban areas are developing and actually enforce the kinds of you know, issues that we ought to be able to you know, uh, take care of. Other than that, we'll find out that uh, you would have a whole massive slum that you even should feel shy calling a city, except for the fact that in certain areas you might find uh, fancy houses or maybe some kind of skyscrapers or what have you. But we do need to inject a certain kind of discipline 
in the development of our settlement areas. Excellent, great. Um, the next question is, how are professional associations helping in encouraging both the government and society at large in sustainable efforts? And I would say, Kwabina can also join in if you want to. <laughs> sure. Uh, I, 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 it's interesting because the professional associations within the country itself tend to be either you know, the medical professions, and they are now helping with the pandemics, you know, situation, especially in the rural areas. Uh, they tend to be uh, very, very vigilant in terms of having to uh, provide some of the basic medical needs uh, in the area. For uh, example, we have this thing called the Veronica bucket. You know, I, 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 in Ghana and most of the villages, they don't have adequate uh, water. So the Veronica bucket is designed in a way that it's portable and it's almost like a, a tap that you can put in different neighborhoods. For example, in my neighborhood with a soap so that people can wash their hands regularly and then uh, folks are also creating their own face mask in terms of like using local materials to create face masks. So uh, we've been very creative. Now on an international level, engineers across border, you know, uh, are also very active in the country. Yeah, I, I, I suppose, you know, Kobra is right about you know, the contribution of some of these uh, professionals uh, and such. But I also would want to add that maybe a, a certain kind of change in the attitude of certain professionals might, might help. For instance, when the British were running, you know, the Gold Coast, architects, for instance, were paid as a, a proportion of the total cost of the project. In that case, the more expensive the project, the higher is obviously going to be an architecture monument. Now that added to the fact that the British aimed at selling Portland cement, you know, to the colonies meant that the architects had to make sure that if the, the floor leading capacity, the wall bearing capacity and, and whatnot of even ordinary houses, you know, appeared like, you know, they were uh, opera houses or what have you, as if they were for massive public use. And we still build that way. And I think we ought to be able to review, for instance, our architects and our engineers and such, especially with housing. We ought to be able to review the way we put, you know, these uh, structures together. You know, and, and, and I believe that there are other, you know, professionals in the system who are in a good position to actually influence a certain direction, a rearrangement of some of the issues that contribute, you know, to, to our you know, the living, you know, situation. That would be very helpful. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you. The next couple of questions that came in were during um, Kobena's um, presentation. So they are, they are referencing his presentation. Um, this one says, fascinating projects in addition to the examples that you mentioned, are improved methods of storing water reserves and irrigation being explored in tandem? Yeah, can you repeat that question in terms of water irrigation? Yes, are improved methods of storing water reserves and irrigation being explored in tandem? Yeah, I, I, it depends on where you are in the, uh, and, 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 
His Excellency, you could jump in with some of the uh, government projects, but it depends on where you are within the country, you know. I mean, when you go to the northern part of the uh, uh, Ghana, uh, they tend to be more of, uh, it tends to be, you know, savanna where water is very uh, scarce, you know, and they also use water for agriculture, irrigation. Now, when you come to the part where I'm from, which is the southern part, the more forested area, uh, we tend to have the rivers uh, and, um, and, 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 and more natural resources in terms of, you know, major rivers. But, you know, lately, uh, because of the illegal mining activities, as I've mentioned before, uh, it's threatened, uh, drinking waters have been threatened because before people can just go to the stream and get water uh, for consumption. But because of the impact on the rivers, uh, now drinking waters are almost uh, in certain areas are scarce. And, you know, there, 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 there are some communities that have wells, you know, uh, and, and those wells are sometimes are done by either the chiefs or the government or well vision. And there's some communities that are fortunate because the current uh, government is making sure that there's free water for everybody. So they get in uh, a pipe system. Uh, where, where my community is located, you know, and I'll be specific, we don't really use water for irrigation. We depend on mother nature. So when you plant certain time of the year, you know the rain will come. And, uh, uh, but because of climate change, we are beginning to see uh, drastic changes. You know, for example, the rain used to come between April and late August. And so you know when you plan during that period, you will get uh, rain, you know. Now, it doesn't come regularly and it comes excessive. When it comes, it's torrential, you know. So I'll stop here, but Doc, I mean, Ambassador, please jump in. No, no, no I, I suppose, you know, whatever you said is, uh, you know, uh, is hitting the, the, the trail uh, properly. But the thing is, for instance, at the moment, the government has a policy of uh, one village, one dam. And that is basically to the northern section that uh, no Kabna mentioned, where because of the uh, seasonality of the rainfall and because it's in the uh, northern part, which is moving closer to the Sahara, rainfall becomes a, a bit of a problem and then that comes with a water supply. So in, in providing the dams for the villages, at least you, uh, you ensure that during the drier season, animals and you know, the, uh, crops you know, could be reasonably watered. And then also, you know, Kwabna mentioned this one problem that we have developed in terms of people in the search for gold, have been prepared to ask it to ruin most of the water bodies that we have. Now that one is not helping. And I suppose that, you know, the, the government uh, should be and ought to be in a good position to try and tackle that. But generally, because in a country, like, at least in Ghana, we have only two seasons, the dry season and the rainy season. So most of tillage, we have to respond to this much of the seasons and so far the availability of precipitation is concerned. So to a large extent, our water management now probably will have to shift a little from relying completely on you know, nature, but then finding uh, other possibilities of storing water to you know, improve on agricultural production. And, and the fact is, the government has this determination that agriculture and especially food production ought to be used as a basis for industrialization. So now, 
there are factories going on which are meant to process some of the food crops we have into exportable items. And this is where, again, good water management, you know, will have to be uh, seriously taken care of. Great. This next question um, kind of piggybacks on a little bit what you've already been talking about. So additionally, do you see any other challenges um, in project implementation, implementation, excuse me, um, in regards to sustainability? <laughs> well, for me, <laughs> um, one of the problems we have is that we haven't managed to tweak our educational system to reflect on the, the kind of sustainability we would want to have. You know, it is all right for all of us to be seriously uh, educated. I mean, uh, Kwabna's dad and I went through a system whereby, uh, for instance, I knew more about the history of Western Europe between 1789 and what have you, as against even the history of my own country or the history of Africa. And then somebody once made a, a comment recently in one of these uh, WhatsApp things that the education that was brought to us was basically to coach us to learn, observe, but it was not intended for us to think and innovate. So most of the things that we do don't even suit the purposes of our lives. And I think we have to retool, you know, uh, our kinds of people, you know, to be able to sustain economic development. I mean, <clears throat> in Ghana at the moment, most of the technical schools have been turned into full-fledged universities. So if you are looking for a carpenter, the chances are that the carpenter might be from Togo. If you are looking for uh, a plasterer or any of these you know, uh, sort of um, technical areas, they probably might end up not being Ghanaian. So we need to, again, we, you know, we have to tweak our education to answer to the areas of our development that ought to be taken care of. You know? And then the, the, the mentality that we tend to have, which says that if, uh, because Kwabna is a lawyer, he must be any more money than somebody who is a, a car mechanic. But the fact of the matter is, there's always this story that people tell about uh, an electric, electrical engineer in Britain. He repairs refrigerators and somebody's refrigerator broke down. So they called him, so he showed up. Within some 10 minutes, the refrigerator was working. And then when he quoted his price, the person said, oh, but for, for the 10 minutes or so, you are charging that much. And he said, I'm sorry, sir, but I'm not charging for the time that I invented, invested. I'm charging for knowing what to do. But you see, we think that um, if Kwabna gets a carpenter to come and fix his doors in his house, his remuneration should not come anywhere near Kwabna's remuneration over that same period or a similar period. So you see, it is you know, that mentality which makes it difficult for artisans and other people to do uh, what they do, you know, also needs uh, a bit of revision. You know, if I would add that, you know, in terms of sustainability, for example, in my village, which I made it my vision that I'm going to make it a model for development in Ghana in terms of rural areas, 
Uh, a few things that we try to do is one, ecotourism sure. as a way to create some kind of uh, uh, businesses or small income for the locals. So they'd be less likely to want to resort to uh, the distraction of illegal gold mining. And then, and then two, you know, we are an area that produce a lot of cocoa, you know, and as you all know, you know, chocolate is uh, something that we all love. Uh, I was telling my mother last January when I was going to Ghana, I bought a small box of chocolate in Amsterdam and that was 65 euros, you know. And so we are in the process of having to plant cocoa and then create the co uh, chocolate locally in our area so that that will bring uh, the type of resource that we need in the area to generate. And that will incentivize, as Doc, uh, His Excellency is saying, that uh, people will be less likely to want to be uh, get a PhD or go to law school or you know because it's it's the history of the country that in ghana everybody thinks that if you get these big degrees then you can do everything sure that's true of many countries and and you know this value of the artisan is very important to understand absolutely and, and then see coming coming you know up with that it's also the attitude of the other countries vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what we produce that they intend by to do what they do. Because, for instance, uh, between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, we produce about 85% of the world's cocoa. But when you look at the dissipation of the expenditures and the earnings of uh, cocoa, what these two countries have doesn't even come closer to what, for instance, even one country like Switzerland makes out of cocoa. And that, again, is problematic. And, you know, the, uh, the basic economic theory says that when factors of production, especially the raw materials, are heavy, you try to position the plant closer to the raw materials. All the cocoa that, for instance, um, you know, Hershey uses in their products, they bring them from Ghana raw. Hershey can produce at least the curvature for what they do in Ghana. Why don't they? You know, because of, you know, whatever it is uh, that they have been used to all these years. And they are usually not, you know, very prepared to sit down and negotiate, or at least listen to alternatives. Yeah. So, you know, Ghana, like lots of the other countries, do have this mountain of skewed economic thinking that we have to climb. And uh, we need, you know, everybody else's uh, help in trying to resolve that. Right, very good. We're going to, this will be our last question, but it's kind of a two-part question, <laughs> a long one. So no we'll, make, we'll make this our, our final one. Um, it says, even though efforts have been made so far, do you deal with the issue of politicizing urban policies and mitigate the tendency of withholding ongoing urban projects due to change in governments? What measures have been put in place to ensure that urban projects continue irrespective of the political party that comes into power? <laughs> that is an interesting question. <laughs> See, um, in most African languages, there is always a word for enemy. But there usually is not, a, there isn't a word for opponent. And therefore, once you have a slight disagreement over an issue, you, you, you are an enemy. So the person doesn't discuss. 
you know, anything with you. Maybe that has influenced the way we play our politics. And then also, we haven't developed, you know, that, uh, you know, character or what have you, as you put it, that yes, government should come and go. But there are certain items in the governance of a country that cannot be subject to political, you know, uh, football. I mean, I believe that there are policies, for instance, in foreign affairs, uh, defense, agriculture, industry, and that where there are certain kind of basic guidelines that we could all follow. The rest are interstitial areas that we need to, you know, um, you know, put in. But across most of Africa, including us, the whole bit about continuity becomes difficult in the political environment. And then, you know, we seem to believe and behave like all that you do is you get up in the morning, brush your teeth with politics, drink politics, eat politics, work politics, and that is it. And if you are not with the Lord, you are against him. So it becomes very difficult. But I think it is um, an issue of what one might loosely call political maturity. Because we are all working, hopefully, in the interest of one country. And sometimes, too, maybe I'm not sophisticated enough, I fail to see even the, the basic differences between you know, policies of various uh, African you know, the political parties. The differences are basically personnel. So it, it, it's a bit, it, it, it's an imponderable question, but it's a question that we, as countries, as communities, with an eye on improving the future for everybody else who falls in the national territory, it's an issue we have to resolve. Yeah, we have to be politically more mature than, the, than we have been so far. Ravina, final words? <laughs> yes, I, I don't think I'm going to touch that one. The ambassador has to, I mean, eloquently answered the question. But what I'll say is this, that thank you so much for your time and uh, for coming. And I'm going to turn it over to Madhu for the conclusion. Okay. Well, I don't have much of a conclusion, except that the time is now and we have to do something about all these things. And I must say that I, you know, as much as I understand from what I see, you know, uh, from this country and through the books, really, um, Hearing from the both of you, I have learned so much and those pieces have all started to come together. And it feels like there, there seems to be uh, many interconnected pieces and much of it belongs, uh, you know, has to do with laying a strong political foundation that sort of stabilizes all these really innovative things that are happening, but happening in bits and parts. So. We are very excited, Kwabina. We will uh, speak again uh, because Andrea now uh, has uh, created a new program called the World Cities Fellows Program. So we will look at internships remotely, not internships, but fellowships remotely to work on such projects. And um, thank you again. I know there are many more questions, but thank you again, Your Excellency. We really, really- Pleasure. Sure. I cannot even tell you how informative and valuable and frankly real this has been. So we go away learning a lot and hopefully inspired to actually learn even more about all these things that are going on. Because whatever happens in Africa doesn't mean, or whatever happens in Ghana doesn't mean that it's not going to affect us. 
we are all interconnected, you know. So it's important that we steer the, the future of this continent in a way that is responsible and doesn't kind of come back to hurt us again, you know. So thank you, thank you all. Um, I believe, Andrea, are there any other announcements you would like to make? No, I just want to thank the ambassador for sharing his time with us this evening. It's been an honor. Um, Kobena, thank you. It's always a pleasure. And to everybody who joined us this evening, thank you. And who showed up for all the events in our series. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. We had a fun time putting this together and, and doing this every night. Um, so yes, thank you. And if you want to view this recording or any of the other recordings from the past events, um, you can find it on the new possible series um, website. And that is in the link, the chat link. So thank you again. Okay. And may, may I take the opportunity and thank you on Kwabna's behalf and on my own behalf for giving us the opportunity of having this kind of a uh, conversation. It's obviously very helpful. Okay. The pleasure has been all ours, but thank you so much for your gracefulness. Thank you. <laughs>